I think this is the most like polished presentation I ever had to give. Um, do you guys know who Zitran is? Like Jonathan Zitran, he wrote The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It. Um, it turns out he was talking right before me, and so I'd emailed him, and he's, he's like one of my, my heroes, um, sort of on the same level as Lawrence Lessig, and I was like, oh, um, I see you're talking. He's like, yep, and I'm practicing, and so I was like, oh, great, now, now I have to practice. So um, this is about sort of conversational computing. Um, it's about answering the question of how, when we want to start modifying the web, and how, when we want to get rid of the lots of the, the interface elements that that sort of comp the, that comprise our, our our browser. How do we make this happen? So, at the very beginning, um, how many of you have been editing a document? Um, you finish it up. It's important. You click close, and it says, "Are you sure you want to quit?" And you're like, "Of course, I want to quit." And you hit the like the the quit button, and like the split second later, you're like, "Ah, bother!" Like. I, um, I, didn't, I didn't mean to do that. You just lost all of your work. Like, yeah, I'm assuming the people that raised their hands did it, and everybody else that didn't raise their hands is just embarrassed to admit it. So the point I want to make is that it's not your fault. Um, and I'm going to come back to exactly why it's not your fault, but it's not your fault because our computers don't work the way people do. And therefore, as we sort of move forward, um, we get interfaces which force us to, to have things like this, right? Um, and this is Word where you just turn everything on. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but 90% uh, of the feature requests for features in Word are, in fact, for features that are already in Word. Um, and it's just really hard to find all that functionality. Why is it hard? And why do our interfaces look like this? Why is it that when we actually let our browser's um, extensions go wild, that we just get toolbar after toolbar after toolbar? Well, it's because we're missing something. We have an incredibly generative method of communication. And in fact, it's probably the thing that makes us distinctly human. And that's language. And in the headlong rush away from the command line, we've gotten rid of language. So we're, we're tying ourselves at the mouth. We are not being human. So um, here's, here's an example of adding language back in. Uh, so here we are. I want to. Um, figure out what the weather is in San Francisco. So I can just open it up and type um, check weather in San Francisco. It pulls it up. It's, it's very similar to the way Google searches work, um, although it happens in real time. And I can just type in F if I want to to see it in Fahrenheit. Or I don't actually have to type everything out. Um, I can just type CHE bath, and then it'll, it'll look up the weather in, in bath. Um, in, in Fahrenheit, or sorry, in, in Celsius. So it's both very fast to use because you can create your own shortcuts, but it's also incredibly easy to learn because you just type what you want to do. So with Google, you type what you want to find. With Ubiquity, you type what you want to, to do. But that's fine. Um, language seems pretty cool. But to be truly global, you have to first be truly local. It's fine that we're talking about sort of extensibility in English, but that doesn't help people um, who live in Taiwan or who live in Denmark. Um, and so what we've been figuring out how to do recently, we spent the last couple of months, is figuring out how do we create grammars um, which are extensible to other languages so that you can have ubiquity work in Japanese, um, that you can have it work in Portuguese, that you can have it work in Dutch. Um, and the really cool thing is that programming isn't actually needed to do this. Um, so we do a lot of natural language processing. The problem with natural language processing, though, is that it's impossible, at least in current technology. Um, and certainly not fast enough. So we cheat, left and right. Um, this is really one of those things where you're a magician and you're saying, like, here, pick any of these three cards, um, but, but pick this one. right? Um, we, we do that all the time. So we use the fact that we know what your context is, what page you're looking at. Um, we know that you are really interested in actions um, that are, are very verb-centric, so we, we can parse those things out. So for instance, when we're parsing Japanese, we don't actually have to look for all the space breaks, which you normally have to do when you're doing natural language parsing of languages that don't have any spaces. Um, instead, we can look for the particles, and we can look for the verbs, and so we can actually get very fast natural language processing and page uh, and, and uh, space splitting for, for these languages 
by just avoiding the problem entirely. Um, and so what's cool is that all of these languages, and we now work, I think, in, in five or six languages, have been contributed by third party folks, people out in the community, that don't know how to program, don't know how to do NLP, and yet are able to add their own languages um, pretty quickly. So we're, we're really, really excited about that. So then we come to the other problem with the web. Um, and that's that tasks are disjointed. Um, and information is really far apart. So to give a really concrete example of this, um, and something that I think we're looking forward to, to solve, is that here I am on a page. I would like to translate some of this text. Um, so here are the, um, the steps. One, select the text. Two, copy the text. Three, open a new tab. Four, translate it. Uh, search for translate. Five, view the search results. Six, choose a service. Seven, paste in your text. Eight, choose a language. Nine, click translate. Ten, read the translation. Eleven, close the new tab. And twelve, try desperately to regain your train of thought. Right? Now multiply across all the things you do on the web. So the point here is no wonder we have a digital divide. Right? No wonder we have people that don't know how to use computers or claim that they're computer illiterate. Because just to do something as simple as that, the number of cognitive steps you had to make, the number of leaps you had to go through to figure out what you wanted to do was immense. Um, and I think the only way to start really combating this problem is by taking the tape off of our mouths and coming back to saying, just say what you want to do. So in ubiquity, um, and I think sort of as, as the future of the web goes on, we have something called TaskFox, which is making its way into Firefox 3.7 or 4 or something like that, um, is you just want to start taking that simplicity of the Google box and applying it to verbs. So in this case, what I'd like to be able to do is if I'm here on a page, I'd like to be able to just make a selection um, and type translate this. It figures out what this means. I hit return, and there we go. It's been translated. That's the sort of simplicity that I think should come to the web. And as Steve was talking about just a second ago, um, as we start making the web go from this static thing that you view, um, and even in Web 2.0, when you have a web which is customized to you, um, you have web pages that are customized to you. What you really want, though, are services that work anywhere on the web that are customized to you, but we know that the GUI model does not scale. So we have to have something else. So you can start doing more interesting things here. So now I can actually just say translate this to Russian. Um, hit return, it'll translate it to Russian. Um, what this enables is what I like to call task-centric computing. Um, and I have a more catchy term for this later, um, called U-centric computing. But there's, a, there, there's a, like a sort of a fundamental design mantra here. And that is every time we as designers force our users to think about how they do something and not what they want to do, we have failed. And this is a metric that whenever we design at Mozilla, we apply um, very tightly. Because otherwise, you're making people think about their tool and not their object. It's sort of the equivalent of saying, like, you have to think about how to use a shovel um, and which way to rotate the handle to be able to dig a hole. If you had to do that, you wouldn't actually be able to dig a hole. Um, so when we sort of take this task-centric thing to the logical conclusion, you want to just be able to start doing things really fast. So here we go. This is what ubiquity looks like in, in, in real life. I just translate it back to English. I'm going to say, highlight this text. Um, I'm now selecting the whole thing. And I'm going to say, email this thing to Jono. Now, a couple cool things are going on here. Um, it's getting closer and closer to the web being about me and about being me-centric, um, which is, I said, email this to Jono. So one, it's done this. Um, two, uh, and it interpolated it. Two, we have email. Um, and email, in this case, says, like, hey, what, what do you do for email? You don't say Gmail or Yahoo Mail um, or, God forbid, Hotmail. Um, it looks at the websites you use. It goes through your places database. And it says, ah, I see that Aza uses Gmail all the time. So with no setup, with really smart defaults, it knows what email means. And finally, Jono, 
because we're the browser, we know who all of your contacts are. We can read your Gmail contacts. We can read your, read your Facebook contacts. Um, and we can do it in a privacy sensitive way because it never goes off to a server. It's all staying local. Um, and so when I type Jono, it knows Jono's email address. So when I hit return, it actually goes ahead and makes that email. Um, this is sort of like the ultimate task centric computer um, and computing system. And what does this drive for? What's like the fundamental thing that we're looking at here that we're trying to save? Um, it's not really time, although time is a big thing we're saving. It's not really efficiency, although this is highly efficient. It's that your train of thought is sacred. And every time we derail that train of thought, again, as designers, we've failed. This is something I think Google can be particularly good at. Um, we have a set of synonyms in there. Um, sorry, I should re repeat the question. Um, if I don't, if for translate, if I, if you don't know the the exact um, words to use, does it help? Um, is there a way of, of solving that problem? And at the moment, I don't think turn into would work, but I, I can't remember the uh, things besides translate. Um, maybe make sense of. But because we know we're doing verbs. Um, we can have a big list of synonyms. And even better, if there was sort of a server-side lookup, well, then you can do the thing where, where you map all these people, um, type this thing. In the end, they went to doing translate. So now we have a statistical model of A to B. Um, and you know, it just becomes a matter of data being 10 times smarter than algorithms. So um, right now, it's a little bit finicky, um, although people don't generally have too much of a problem. In fact, what we've discovered in user testing is that especially elderly people really like this because they no longer have to think like, what does what that little icon with a broken coffee mug do? That's spell check? Why? Right? Instead, they can just remember spell check. And it, it turns out that that mapping is much easier. So I want to give you another example, and this is sort of my favorite one, which is that if you want to email a restaurant to a friend, well, I can't even add a map, just a link. Right? And it's 2009 which is just sort of sad. So how do we want to do this? Now, now I'm going to switch over to, to using Yahoo Mail. Um, and I'm going to make a selection here. Uh, I'm going to s oops, did I do that? Oh, no, no, come back. Um, there we go. Um, I'm going to select this address, Oyaji in San Francisco, which you haven't been to, should all go. It's phenomenal. Um, I type map this. I zoom in using. Uh, using Google Maps, and I've hit Enter, um, and it's inserted the map directly into my email, which is sort of cool because, one, this is Google Maps finally working together with Yahoo, um, which hopefully you won't like send, send people after me for. Um, but that's really cool because all of a sudden, we didn't have to wait for Yahoo to go implement a particular feature. We got it immediately. Right? We don't ever have to wait for developers to add features. This is what I think Steve was talking about a little bit when he said, like, how do we start making the web really personal um, and customizable, is that the web is about you and the things you want to do um, and not the way that the developer set it up. But we can go a lot further here. Um, oh, by the way, uh, I, I talked to, to the Gmail team a little bit and asking them, is anybody here on the Gmail team? Um, about why you guys didn't actually have this sort of functionality in, in Gmail, because it seems to be a, a fairly common use case. Um, and the answer is that, I guess, it wasn't as common as we thought it was. And so you guys instead added emoticons. That's, that's cool. Um, so let's say I'm sending this email to, to a friend that's visually impaired. What I'd like to be able to do is use the edit command in this case. Um, and uh, a guy named Jacob um, wrote this command for Ubiquity. And it essentially is a full image editor that just works by you select an image, type edit image, and it goes. So right now I'm inverting an image, um, click done, and there we go. So we now have just edited an image in place. When I hit send, it'll go off to the other person. Um, so we think this is really, really cool. So what does this do? This takes people from being sort of helpless. And as we know from the study of happiness, it's helplessness which makes people feel the most depressed. And we try to make them in control. So that's what we call u centered computing. And on the flip side, we're looking at how does this affect 
developers? Um, how does this sort of democratize the ability to develop? So right now, if you want to create a, a cool piece of functionality, um, you have to make a destination website first, right? Um, or you make a service which other people build on top of, but you really need that destination website to have people come. And this is, we, I mean, we see startups doing this all the time where they have a feature instead of a website and they try to build a startup and it, of course, inevitably tanks. So if instead we can abstract the idea of functionality out of any particular web page and let it float across the entire web, then you don't have to write that entire website to have something compelling. So in this case, there was editing an image. Um, and we didn't have to first have a flow where you take an image, pull it into a website, edit it, and then try to put it back. It just floats wherever. Um, so it opens up a whole bunch of sort of new business models, I think, for the web, um, and breaks a whole bunch of old ones, which, which is totally fun, because all of a sudden, page use doesn't matter as much. Um, just as an aside, one of the things I think is crazy is that we've optimized our websites, and in fact, the entire business model of the web, to, um, to maximize the number of page views. And so if you go, say, look at the New York Times, um, they will split up their articles. They'll paginate. And the reason why, if you go talk to any of them over there, Koi Vin, it's because they want to maximize page views, which of course is crazy since if you scroll down, they could load new ads in any way. But we're actually building in bad user experience with our business models. Um, and I know that, that you guys here probably fight with this all the time as you're like, well, here's one user experience, um, which is demonstrably better, but is it demonstrably better enough to get over the revenue bump that we'll get for having an extra page view here? Um, so how can we start changing that? I think that's by this sort of switch to functionality um, that exists anywhere, um, and then mapping your uh, revenue stream to matching intent to action, which is what you guys already do with AdSense. So I'm sort of preaching to the choir. And what happens if you can do this? Well, that means you no longer have to go through that full app development cycle to get really cool functionality. And you can have you know, people that work on the EXO in, in other places. It, it lowers the barrier to entry for making functionality which you can share with your friends. and gets back to that sort of visceral beauty of the old Apple II programming days where you could just say plot X, Y, and having something pop up on screen, except for something that's functional for friends. So I think it fundamentally democratizes the way that we're going to write functionality and software. So that means we go from a web of nouns, which is what we have right now with static, to a web of verbs. So one final thought. Um, and this is the one that sort of leads into to Jetpack. And this is about hackability. In the real world, when I'm looking at something, um, I don't know, this thing, um, I can hack this in any way I want, which in this case, I don't, I don't know, I could um, fold it up a little bit, and you know, now, now it's an eye patch. Um, well, not a very good one. Um, this is what happens when I don't have enough sleep. There we go. All right. Um, in the software world, we can't really do this, right? If you have the source code, you can modify something, but you can't really modify it in C2. When you see it, you can't change it. Okay, this is a little bit annoying. But in the real world, of course, we can always destroy or modify and change. So how can we, we bring this in? So this is what the real world looks like, right? If you have a cell phone and you don't have a Bluetooth headset, this is how you can hack it up with you know, 10 cents of, of technology. So we want to bring this back to the web. And here's one very simple example. Here I am on Google. Um, and I'm going to use the, uh, the edit page command. And let's say that I want to compete with Google personally. Well, I'm just going to come here. I'm uh, going to delete that. And I'm just going to say, is a search. Um, so this is a little bit toy, of course, but the point being is that, oh, and this works, by the way. You save it, you go back, and it'll say that as, as long as you want. Um, that the web is now yours because you can modify the web in any way that you like. And this is, I think, the very the, the beauty of the web itself is sort of the infinite canvas um, is that you can change it. So sort of in conclusion, saying perhaps by adding language, by making things hackable, we go from interfaces um, which are which uh, work to our to our failabilities, right, um, and our frailties, and instead are a little bit more human, 
and hence a little bit more humane. Um, and that's, that was that talk. So I think then, I mean, we, you can have questions. Um, by the way, what I forgot to mention when I was doing this at TED is that this is out as being used by around half a million people um, and has a couple thousand commands that people have written for it. So it's, it's a little bit, I mean, it's not a toy, right? If it was a startup, it'd be pretty large. For Mozilla and Google, it's, it's still pretty small. Um, so are there any questions there before I sort of start talking about Jetpack a little bit? What are you guys doing after? I mean, um, I mean, this it's open source, right? Um, so we're working on getting that experience right um, in our little purview. But we, we, I mean, I think we made a, a huge social faux pas, right? We call this thing ubiquity, and we only work in Firefox. Like, if we were Microsoft and had done that, we'd, we'd have gotten a lot of um, a lot of tomatoes flung at us, right? So I absolutely think that in the future these things should run across all platforms. I mean, on the web, and we already know this, it's like there's no sustainable advantage to, to any particular feature. Um, and the best features move, I think, from one sort of originator to all, all browsers. Um, and we're certainly looking forward to that. Um, it'll be an interesting question to come back to when, when we start looking at Jetpack stuff as well. I thought you were going to say, does it blend? Um, that, that is a good question. So um, this actually goes hand in hand with, I think, security, which is a little bit of an odd answer. Um, but, but wait, I'll explain. Um, with security, a lot of the problems are that it's really hard to explain technical problems in people terms. So what I sort of think we should start playing with is modeling the real world a little bit more. In this case, when I have a mother or a father or um, an uncle or aunt that doesn't understand how to go out and buy a new computer, what do they do? They will ask me or they'll ask a nephew or they'll ask a son, um, somebody uh, or, or a daughter, somebody who really understands technology. They will outsource that decision-making process, right? Um, and they will turn the security issue from a technology problem into a people problem. Um, Oh, they'll turn the, the computer buying decision from a technology problem into a people problem. So in security, I think we can sort of play with that same thing. And if we know who your friends are and who your close social net is, um, you can start figuring out interesting ways of, of outsourcing and turning these problems into people problems. So how does this help with discoverability? Oftentimes, we learn new functionality for, say, Photoshop. When we walk behind somebody and we're watching them use Photoshop, you're like, how did you just do that? Right? It's sort of the over-the-shoulder learnability. Um, well, what happens if we start implementing things like that for, for the web? So say somebody uh, did that thing with the photo manipulation, um, and they sent it to me. And there's a little flag in there, a little meta thing that says, oh, by the way, they use this command to make it. Um, and my computer says, oh, or the other person's computer says, oh, I, um, I haven't done that before. Maybe I should prompt something in, in a not annoying, clippy sort of way, like, hey, there's something cool here that just happened. Perhaps you want to learn how to do this thing. And you're like, yeah, of course I do. And now all of a sudden, it's a social problem, right? It's a social networking virality problem for how you make functionality take off and not a pure sort of interface design thing. Um, so it turns a technology problem into a people problem. Um, that said, there's still a lot we can do, I think, on the interface front to make things more discoverable. So in Firefox, between 3.7 and 4, we'll be adding this kind of stuff to the awesome bar. Um, and as you type, start typing Google, it'll probably suggest the Google verb for you. Um, and as you start doing particular actions, it'll, it'll jump in and be like, ha, huh, you, might, you might mean this. Um, and the final answer to that is that I think we're also going to have um, sort of a mouse-based edition, where if you select something on page, and it says this is in a different language, well, maybe you want to translate it, because we can detect that. Or if it's an address, maybe you want to map it. Um, 
Because those, those are the sort of the three levels of answering that question. Um, one is that we know we're going to cheat a lot. Um, we are not sending out sort of ivory tower style and saying we're going to start with NLP and work our way backwards. Um, instead, we start with use cases and we say we want this to work and then we make it happen. Um, and we're, we're fine with that sort of like 80% use case um, because that's already way better than you currently are. Two is that you know at Mozilla, you know we're we're a smaller not-for-profit company um, and. You guys can actually do something that we can't, right? You can go out and for your labs, you can you can hire you know thousands or hundreds at least of, of the smartest people out there. Um, at Mozilla, we, we can't really do that, um, which turns out I think to be a, a big benefit to us because that forces us to work in the open and work transparently and get other people involved at a, at a very early stage. Otherwise, we just we can't compete, right? Um, not saying that we're competing per se. Um, we're working together to make the web better. Um, so in this case, like when we set out to do a lot of like the, the natural language stuff for how do you translate across multiple languages, um, we ended up working with some of the smartest linguists out there because they just sort of jumped in and they thought it was awesome. Um, and because it was being used by real people already with 500,000 users, that adds a certain level of pragmatism. Um, and so I think, as far as I know, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that we're the, this is the only project that's ever done sort of translatable natural language processing that non-programmers can do and participate in. And the only reason why we're able to do that is because of that focus on pragmatism and because we cheat. Um, and we're fine cheating a lot because of the context that we have. So that's why I think we're going to be able to succeed because we're willing to, to cut those corners. We're not doing it sort of like ivory tower, white room style. Oh, it. yeah. So really simple. Um, it's a little bit of JavaScript. You essentially to show a notification, a little thing that pops up. You say ubiquity dot notifications dot show. Um, in fact, you can. There's a shortcut to just display message like hi to you. Um, you save that as a JS file, and now it'll run as ubiquity script. Um, if you want to share it with other people, you add a link rel commands equals, um, and you've now shared it. When you go to a page, it shows. So perhaps this is a good time to start showing off a little bit um, about Jetpack, um, because it took a lot of the lessons we learned in the back end of Ubiquity and applied it to, to making um, this is going to be interesting. How do I actually do this? Uh, and applied it to making uh, extensions. Gather windows, maybe? All right. All right. So here I am, and this is, this is Jetpack. Um, and this is sort of roughly the equivalent of sort of the extension mechanism you guys are working on for, for Chrome. Um, although it has, has some, some differences. So I'm going to come over here to the tutorial, or at least I'm going to try to come up to the tutorial. Um, and I don't have Firebug installed. That's, that's pretty good. Well, that's going to make things a little bit less interesting. Let's open up the Air Console instead. Illegal character. Nice. This is what happens when you use development builds. Still with illegal character. Hmm. All right. 
Um, I think you guys should all just tweet that you're seeing the most amazing demo ever. And that way, even if you guys can't see it, you'll make everybody else jealous that they didn't get to. All right. You know what we're going to do? You're going to talk amongst yourselves, and I am going to go start a new profile. That's how this is going to happen. You're, you're not talking. All right. Actually, I feel like there should be something I could do here. I probably entered something incorrectly somewhere. Yeah. I'm probably, well, I'll, I'll try it once more. Tutorial. OK, here we go. Um, so we're really big into sort of developer ergonomics. Um, and this looks very similar to the way that, that Ubiquity scripts work. Um, and our sort of our litmus test here is that if you can't write an extension in five minutes or a hello world, we've failed as a platform. And if you can't do it in one minute, um, then we're probably on the wrong foot. So here is like the, the simplest thing you can do, which is to add something to the status bar. Um, in this case, I say jetpack.statusbar.append, and I just pass it some HTML. So I'm actually going to click the button. Um, and now it's actually run this right in the browser. Um, and you can see if I, if I change this to, to bam, zip, pow, try out this code, where we're actually modifying the browser in real time. Um, and let, let's do something slightly more interesting here. I'm going to come down and I'm going to say jetpack status bar to depend, HTML, I'm going to give it a width. And I'm going to say on ready, I'm going to pass in the widget. I'm going to say, this is all jQuery in here for people that don't know. When you click on it, I'm going to show a notification that says booming. I'm going to find the currently focused tab, jetpack.tabs.focused. I'm going to get the content document. Um, so here, I'm going to find its body. I'm going to change its background color to blue. I'm going to animate its opacity to half. Um, so there we go. It says boom down here. I'll just change it to bam because I want to show you I have nothing up my sleeves. And when I click on the button, we've actually modified it. And what's cool is, of course, no matter where I go, um, I now have this functionality. I can come back here and I'm like, well, actually, that's really annoying. So I'll change this to 1. Um, and let's change this back to white. So now all of a sudden, we're starting to get an incredibly fast prototyping environment for changing the web to make the web yours. This is sort of like taking the idea of, of Grease Monkey um, and mashing it up with extensions and then giving it all steroids. Um, so let's say I want to do, as a very simple example, um, I want to do some sort of flash kill application. Um, I just want to get rid of all, all flash. So here we're actually, this is a much simpler thing. Uh, all I'm saying is that on ready, uh, find the currently focused document, find all the embeds and remove them, um, try out this code. And then when I go to YouTube, and uh, yeah, that's exactly what I want to be watching. There we go. Sweet. When I hit boom, it just it kills it, right? <laughs> um, which turns out to be incredibly useful. How do you distribute it? As, as Steve was asking before, it's one line of code. You just put link rel, jetpack, um, and it works. So if I actually go to jetpack.mozillalabs.com um, and I want to get this sort of fun functionality here, so let's go to uh, the jetpack demos. And now I'm interested in installing this tab grapher, which is a little acute thing which shows me how I can, uh, what my tab usage over time is. Um, I click, you can see that it says this page contains a Jetpack feature. If you'd like to install it, please click the right button. So I click it. It's been installed successfully. Um, and now as I open up new tabs, you can see that it's graphing it over time. Um, now the cool thing is that if I come here and look at the source code, right, um, you can see that in fact here's the link rel uh, right here. I go to graph.js, and here's the source code. It's 
even on this tiny monitor, it's one line or it's one page of code to do all of that. Because um, really, I'm just I'm doing some code which updates the graph. Um, I do some hooks that say when the tabs are open, closed, and focused to do something. I create the status bar widget. Um, and the one bit of fun funky thing that I'm doing here is that I have, I'm embedding an entire web page into the status bar, in this case, status bar.html. And whenever I add a new uh, thing to the DOM, um, it's just graphing. So what's, what makes this sort of, oops, what makes this fun um, is that when I, when I come back to, I'm a jetpack here, um, I, I can actually, instead of having it be a, uh, piece of HTML, I can actually just put uh, HTTP colon slash slash www.google. And I've now just embedded all of Google into the status bar, right? Um, why this is useful, I'm not entirely sure, but it, it is sort of fun. So that, that's sort of like the, the, the mentality that we have. is just like, if you can do it in a web page, you can now do it in the browser. Um, and then we start going a little bit further. You can start saying like, well, Let's, um, let's do things with libraries. So Twitter certainly isn't sort of a core feature, but you should be able to import it. Um, so right now we have jetpack.lib.twitter that Im imports things. Um, and you can just tweet. You can have email notifiers. So here's a, well, almost one page. It's like 50, 60 lines of code um, that is uh, at gmail.com. Password, I will try desperately not to say out loud. Um, and there we go. So in just a very small amount of code, we have a full Gmail notifier, um, which I believe will work when I click on it. So all of a sudden, it starts taking the things that you have an idea, and you can translate it into changing the browser almost instantaneously, right? It, it's a much shorter path. Um, and actually, this is something that I think we don't like, is that we've, we've started doing um, fun things with um, with audio recording, for instance. So I'm going to view the source here. Um, and essentially what this does, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit um, full of stuff, but it, it adds the ability to add audio recordings and annotations to, to the browser. Um, so the, the interesting things here are that we have jetpack.future.import, um, because these are things which are so advanced they're coming from the future. Um, which we stole shamelessly from, from Python. And we have audio slide bar and storage um, because we haven't finished doing all of those things. We have the ability to play audio here, jetpack.audio.play. Um, and then someplace down here, record. We have jetpack.audio.isrecording and then stop recording and then record to file. So these things are now sort of built into to Firefox. So when you install it, I can actually um, go to a page that I like. Let's go to Google again. Um, well, actually, let's, let's go to Yahoo just, just to make things interesting. Um, I'm going to make an audio recording, which is now recording. Like, I am in your Yahoo recording all of your music. I've stopped recording. Um, and as you can see, we're on Yahoo, and there's a, a sound here. Let's give this a go. I am in your Yahoo recording all of your music. So that has worked. And what's sort of fun is because we have something, I mean, this is the slide bar. It's, it's like a sidebar, but, but more slidey. Um, that when I come back to, to Yahoo in the, oh, well, apparently when I'm at Google, it does that. When I go to Yahoo in the future, um, apparently I didn't do it this time, um, this thing will sort of say, like, yes, I have something to, to show. I don't, I don't know why I'm doing that. No? Well, I, I don't know why it's deciding that. Oh, I know why. OK, there we go. And now when I come back to Yahoo in the future, it will not notify me. It's strange. But anyway. Um, it's sort of like the, the concept, which is still like within 100 lines of code, you can have full voice annotations for the web. And you could clearly start taking this to the next step and, and sharing them and doing all sorts of other things. So that's 
Jetpack sort of in the, uh, in, in the, the really quick sort of hacky form. Um, you can go download it, jetpack.mozillalabs.com, um, and yeah, play with it. So. Um, so, I mean, th there's a lot going on. So, so one of the, like, the visions behind Jetpack is the, what happens if any eighth grader that can write code um, can now modify the browser? If anybody who has just a modicum of ability to use the web, if the browser just was the web, right? That's, that's the vision. Um, and that's cool because all of a sudden we've, I, I keep using the word democratized, but we have democratized um, the ability to write functionality, and especially in a world where in the next 10 years more people are going to touch the web for the first time that are online right now, that's really important. Um, I remember uh, when Mozilla in Taiwan just added like one button which gave you a link to the top news items for Taiwan. We increased the number of downloads by 2 million um, pretty much overnight, right? So localization in that sense of functionality is super important. Um, but we, I mean, we, we have a definite problem, and that is this thing is shiny. It's new. We don't have to write Zool. Um, it's really easy to get involved. And that means that every team looks at Jetpack at Mozilla as sort of like the savior. Like, this is their chance to start again and get everything right, um, that, that second system syndrome, like, to the T. Um, but one of the things that we know we need to get right is the security stuff. Um, and so we're playing around a lot with object capability systems. Um, right now, in the web, there's sort of two security models. There's the you're on a web page. And if you're on the web page, all you can do is what web pages can do, um, which is, is pretty limited um, and a little bit broken in the sense that when you import, I mean, Crockford can talk about this way better than I can, but when you import something, it gets all the privileges of the owning page, and you can get owned in, in horrible ways. And on the flip side, you're in Chrome, in which case you can do anything like send all of your porn to your grandmother, um, which she might thank you for later. I don't know. It depends on your grandmother. So what we have to do is figure out some sort of like in-between system. And so we're playing around with object capability systems. We've been working with, with the Kaha team here. Um, and what we've come up with is something we call like a flexible membrane, which is essentially the, the idea of membranes from, from object capabilities, except that they're programmable in JavaScript, so we can iterate really fast. Um, and what we'll probably end up with are systems that have auto-determined uh, manifests. That is, you go use your program in developer mode for a while, it figures out what sorts of capabilities it needs, it bundles it up as, as a manifest, and then we can have um, people on our gallery site review the manifest, check it against the functionality, and if that looks OK, supply it to the end user with, with a like scary, not scary sort of metric. Um, the other cool thing that we're playing with is the idea that libraries should be able to have different um, permissions than a Jetpack writing it. So I can write a Jetpack, which has no ability to make network calls, but I can import a reviewed Twitter library, and that can make a, uh, a library call. Um, but I, I mean, so there, there's some leakage that is bound to happen, so you have to be careful. But I think this starts moving us a long ways towards something which is a lot more secure, even if you're in Chrome. Because um, as I showed you right now, like even when you're in Chrome space, like in the status bar, that's still HTML. So we're not actually doing Zool. That's that's true. Um, in Jetpack, you can't. There is no API to look at files yet, since we it's sort of a little bit scarier. Um, and probably the way we're going to want to do the record in the future, and actually in the next version of Jetpack that will be coming out, is that it'll do a streaming version, and you can modify the the frames as they go by in place, um, which is more fun anyway. Um, but yes, I think we're going to have to tackle that problem eventually. Other sort of questions. Uh -huh. So this ubiquity of Jetpack is critically lower the bar. Uh, the more, more power uh, that's simpler. Uh, but because of Jetpack, maybe ubiquity uh, might still be too much for my own. So how do we get, you know, so we're moving from enabling 1% of internet users. 
So one of the statistics that I was sort of surprised about is how many uh, users have Firefox add-ons installed. I was guessing 10%, um, because we have a pretty passionate user base. That's, it's a lot of work to go get an extension. It turns out that at minimum it's 33%, but our estimates seem to show that it's up higher towards 50%, um, which was phenomenal. I've certainly seen um, sort of use cases from, from WoW, where there's a, the big IE hole like a year ago. Um, people starting to switch in droves to, to Firefox, and you could see people recommend NoScript um, and Adblock Plus, which was bizarre to me because I, I don't use like Adblock Plus. Um, and yet people are out there actually using it. So I don't actually think that, especially things like Jetpack, have that sort of that, that small 1% um, use case. What we're going to see is that as people drive adoption of, of really cool new functionality, um, as more and more people get involved, you know, that you, you get that power law, um, and you get, and certainly most of everything is going to be really bad uh, functionality or not very useful for the mass public, but they're going to get those couple that are, are really useful and we're just sort of increasing the throughput. Um, and then our job becomes how do we hook people up to the functionality that they need. So you can imagine this to be the exact same question as how do you take bands and hook them up to the audience that will love them. Um, so a lot of this I think is going to be collaborative filtering. When you go to a site and you have usage behavior which matches sort of a generic usage behavior of particular add-ons, perhaps we should start suggesting these things to you. Um, maybe if all of your friends are using something and use a similar site that you do, then maybe we should suggest that to you. So I think those are going to start being the interesting cases of how do we get you the functionality that you don't know that you want. Um, I mean, the answer is yes. Um, so Ubiquity is, is being ported to, um, to Fennec um, and Jetpack certainly as well. So you can just sort of write once and go anywhere. And I think right now, um, I mean, we, we talk to the Chrome team every once in a while about sort of like some of the synergies. Oh, I just used a horrible word, sorry. Some of the similarities between our two platforms. Um, and in the future, we'll see where, as, as we sort of get further down to, both towards the 1.0s of our extension platforms where um, we can standardize. Um, and then I think it'll just sort of run across all browsers. Because in the end, it'd just be phenomenal if you can write a little bit of JavaScript and HTML and it just ran everywhere in all browsers. I thought that was kind of what he was asking, actually, was not so much about the usage hmm. of Jetpack results, but you started out with this natural language yeah. part, this Alice part, this yep. Yep. How can a person like your grandmother who's getting my more be able to create her own? Right. And so this is, I think, the cool thing. Because if we can have, um, instead of right now we have 8,000 people, yeah, 8,000 people that are active Firefox extension developers, um, which, is, which is huge, actually. That's, that's, that's a lot. Um, and we passed the 1.5 billion, I think, download mark for Firefox add-ons. So there's clearly a huge market for it. But if we can take that 8,000 people, um, and right now they have highly specialized knowledge, and we can scale that so that we have 80,000 people writing it, or even better, 100,000, or maybe even a million, given the number of websites that are out there, well then, probably, if you as an end user, if your grandmother is, and as an end user is having a problem with a site, the likelihood is that somebody else already had that problem and probably wrote something which is a decent solution to it. So it's sort of collapsing the space of end user programming to search, right? Which should make you guys really happy. So I, th I think that's the sort of the, the vision is that once you have sort of this huge number of things, you have to start being really smart about how do you then hook up people to the functionality that they want because simply thinking like, oh, I'm at Gmail, um, I really wish it did X. Well, that's sort of a dead end thing right there. Or even worse, I'm at Gmail, I do a whole bunch of things, and I just sort of find it clunky. Um, what you really want to do is just sort of bridge that next step and say, well, here's your solution. Have that. You talk a little bit about the, the sort of nuts and bolts of your API. Like how, do people, how do you compose what you're trying to do when you're building this functionality? How do you learn, oh, here's where I want to be able to flip something and, and rewrite what's in a div or rewrite what's in a Right. 
Um, so a lot of it, I think, comes down to sort of like learning pedagogy. Um, and that is like we're, we really like the thing where you can click and edit and play and like get these really, really tight feedback loops. And if I had Firebug up, you can show that um, if I go console.log inside one of the jetpacks, it'll put it into Firebug and you can introspect right there, um, which, is, which is pretty hot. Um, I think the APIs, or we're trying to write the APIs in such a way that it's fairly obvious what they do. So if you say jetpack.toolbar, you're in toolbar land. Or for your jetpack.status bar, you're in status bar land. So it's not too bad, I think, from a developer ergonomic standpoint. Like if you know the web, then it's not too, too bad to, to jump into here. Um, and then we leverage things like J, uh, jQuery or Dojo. So if you already have your favorite, and we don't do Dojo at the moment, but eventually, or pretty soon, we'll, we'll enable the use of all the sort of standard libraries so that to modify the web, you can just say, you know, jQuery dot find me this thing like I did with the embeds dot remove. Um, and it's, it's not too bad, right? It's not like you have to go click on things and, and figure it out. So I don't really know if that's answering your question. Yes. I mean, we're, we're, we're th certainly playing around with that idea. Um, most visual IDEs are, I mean, it's like a WYSIWYG editor. They, their, their leaky abstraction is so big that you end up just getting your feet really wet. Um, but I think in the future, there are going to be use cases which we discover people do over and over and over again, right? Writing an IDE to create toolbars, although we want to get rid of toolbars, but that seems reasonable. To make a status bar widget, that seems reasonable. Um, to do more complex functionality, meh, maybe not. Um, and so, you, I mean, the, the cool thing is that because these jetpacks are so easy to write, my guess is that at some point soon we're going to start seeing third-party uh, websites, which you go to and be like, I want a status bar that does this. And we don't have to come up with everything. Um, for APIs are pretty enough. We build it, they will come, which is not really true, but it might be. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks very much, Aza. I like Jetpack, and it gives me a glimpse of something that maybe in the future could run cross-browser so we can start building extensions that would work uh, for everyone who's on the internet. That would be very cool. Or the, the flip way of thinking about that is the, the browser should just be part of the web, should be of the web, and then you're just writing for the web, and that just happens to run across all browsers because you know, it's just a byproduct of the future. All right. Thanks very much.